For whatever reason, I've always been drawn to the military, and it's one of the things in my life that I have regrets over, that I didn't serve my country in some way. But one of the things that's very interesting to me is all the, the armed forces that have special forces. Now, they're all very important, but for some reason, I've always been drawn to the Navy SEALs. And I know they get all the, the hype and all that stuff, and it's, it's really not because my dad was in the Navy, but it's because of my love for the ocean and my hate of beach sand. You see, beach sand has a way of making its way into places it doesn't belong. And I don't know if you've ever been to the beach and you've walked all day and you get it on your calves and you're trying to get it off and you can't seem to ever get it off. You go to put it in your shoes and you just kind of grind in just a little bit. You get back into your room and you realize there's sand all over the place. And then worse yet, you go to bed and you realize, oh no, sand's in my bed too. And so I think that may be the reason that the Navy SEALs have such a high attrition rate because they get out and they lay in the water in long pants and t-shirts and then they get back up on the beach and sometimes they do this thing called a sugar cookie where they lay down in the sand and they intentionally put sand all over themselves in their hair, their face, and then they train that way for an entire week. Class 258 had an attrition rate that was tremendous. They started with like 130-something people and they ended up with like 32 within three days. In fact, it got so bad that the way that they were motivating one another was to look at each other and just say, don't quit. Don't quit. But I think we're at a point in Christianity, a hinge point, if you will. And a hinge point are those things in history that come around every three, four, five hundred years where something is going to make a major shift. And I'm afraid that we're starting to see as a church, as a denomination, as a world religion of Christianity, we're starting to see an attrition rate Almost to the point where I'm afraid we may need to start looking at each other and just yelling, don't quit, don't quit. And what I find so interesting is that so many people started out so passionately in their faith. So much passion only to watch it dwindle away. I don't know if you've ever met anybody that's really passionate about something. So passionate that it's kind of like, ugh, you know, it's, that's just too much. It's over the top. I don't know if you've ever seen anybody that's so in love, that is so passionate, that it's kind of like, ugh, I don't know about that. You know, people walking in the mall with their hands in each other's back pocket. You know what I'm talking about. We're from Athens. Or maybe they were passionate about something else. Maybe it was passionate about a product. How many of you are passionate about your phones, especially your iPhone? I think... I think Apple could sell you an iPhone with a cracked screen and you would still buy it. And you would just say, well, it's just helping me skip a step, right? How many of you have ever had a phone that's got a cracked face on it? Yeah, I have never cracked a screen on my phone. What in the world are y'all doing with the phones? Throwing them at each other? I don't doubt it. Maybe there's something else that you've been very passionate about. Maybe a restaurant. I know that I get passionate about going to Destin and eating seafood and how I love coconut shrimp and the orange marmalade sauce at Pompano Joe's. Or maybe you know somebody that's really passionate about sports and they do this kind of crazy stuff. They paint themselves. You've seen them in the stands before, especially at basketball games. Now, I don't want all that mess all over me, but they're passionate enough to do that. Passion. Passion is an interesting thing. In fact, I think that's what we need to bring back our faith the way that it used to be. I think it's what it's going to be in order for us to survive, is for us to get passionate once again about Jesus and the church. And so today I thought I would share arguably one of the most passionate stories in all of Scripture. And maybe you've read it before, maybe not, that's okay. I don't know how familiar you are with Scripture, so I'm going to give you a quick Bible study the, the story is going to come out of the book of Acts. And if you're following along with the Bible reading of all of us that are trying to go through the New Testament in a year, you just finished Acts. And I couldn't wait to get up every day and see where Paul was going. But ultimately, what was going to happen to him? And that's one of these stories today. He's got a buddy of his, Silas. And he's going to go and do some extreme things. But here are some Acts facts. Say that three times really quick and see what happens to you. Now, Acts and Luke were once one book. Somewhere in Christianity and the history of of Christ, they got separated, but they were written together. So if you bring in the read the word of Luke, you want to go into Acts next. Then it was written by Luke because the two books were once the same book. 
Number three, Luke did not perceive paganism as the church's principal threat, rather the church's outreach and loss of connection with core beliefs and practices of Israel. And the way I explain that is I personally interpret that in as they lost their passion. They lost their passion of what brought them to Christ. And in a minute, I'm going to give you my thoughts on that. So what's the story? The story is this. One day on our way, and that's going to be Paul and Silas, to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic. And with her fortune telling, made a lot of money for the people that owned her. She was like property. She was like their business. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, these men are working for the Most High God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. In other words, they were passionate. And in their passion, they're telling everybody about their faith, about Jesus. She did this for a number of days. If you ever had, maybe you're a child at one time, used to ask you a question over and over and over to you like, I am fed up with this. Quit asking that question. And so, finally, fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her. Anybody here ever have a child you thought maybe be spirit, maybe spirit possessed? I never thought about that. Commanded the spirit that possessed her out in the name of Jesus Christ. Get out of her. And it was gone. Just like that. When her owners saw that their lucrative business was suddenly bankrupt, it was their meal ticket, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up, and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them. Can't have nothing. They've been beat up. Now they're going to go to the square. They're going to get arrested and pull them into court with the accusation, these men are disrupting the peace, dangerous Jewish agitators subverting our Roman law and order. That sounds serious. By this time, the crowd had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob, mob mentality, had Paul and Silas' clothes ripped off and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. Now right now, you've got to literally feel beat down, right? I mean, all you're doing is walk around telling people how to have a better life, Tell them about this guy that had done something incredible for you. Now you find yourself beaten naked. Now you're in, in jail, mob mentality, and now you've got a jailkeeper assigned to you. All Hey, the difference a day can make. He did just that. Threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail. And I'm pretty sure jail conditions then weren't real good. And clamped leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas, and this is crazy stuff, were at prayer and singing not just any hymn, but a robust hymn. They were singing with passion to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered, every door flew open, all the prisoners were loose. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw the doors swinging loose on their hinges. Assuming that all the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in, figuring he was as good as dead anyway. When Paul stopped him, and I'm sure it was something like this, you know, don't do that! (laughs) Because you had to, you know, come in with some force, right? I mean, it's a matter of seconds. We're all still here. Nobody's run away. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. I mean, imagine how his emotion had taken a turn so quickly. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked them, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved to really live? They said, put your entire trust in the Master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live. And everyone in your house included. They went on to spell out the detail of the story of the Master. They gave their testimony. The entire family got in on this part. They never did get to bed that night. You talk about passion. The jailer made them feel at home, dress their wounds, and then he couldn't wait till morning, was baptized, he and everyone in his family. There in his home, he had food set out for a festive meal. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God. Everyone in the house was in on the celebration. 
At daybreak, the court judges sent officers with the instructors, release these men. The jailer gave Paul the message. The judges sent word that you're free to go on your way. Congratulations. Go in peace. Now I want you to hold that thought for a moment. Because that is passion field. Incredible things are going on there. But I want to ask you this. Have you ever been gung-ho about something only to find yourself losing your passion for it? That you are so fired up that maybe it's a project at home that's still sitting there that you had passion for at one time and now it's still not completed? Well, my theory is this. For those of you that have ever done it, my theory is this. We begin to lose our passion when we begin to make excuses. We began to lose our passion when we began to make excuses. Maybe there's a time that you were you know, really passionate about a profession or a career or, or a hobby or something in your life. And then something happened. As time passed, you began to make excuses for it. Maybe I'm a parent now. I'm too old. I don't know how I could go back to school. The list could go on and on. Or maybe it was passion for a musical instrument. I've always wanted to, to you know, do what John David and some of the praise band what they're doing, but you know, I just don't have time to learn an instrument. I don't have money to, to take lessons. Or maybe it was exercise. You know, I have kids now and I, I need to get them all over the place and it doesn't leave me much time afterwards. And so I don't have time to exercise. Or maybe it was once your health and you let yourself go. And you said, you know what? One day I'll spend time on myself. But for now, I've got too many irons in the fire. Or maybe it was a relationship with your spouse. Maybe one time you were passionate about dating your spouse and kissing them on the lips and and hugging them in front of people and, and all that stuff that you used to think as a kid, mom and dad, please, not here. And maybe now that passion is gone somewhere and you find yourself, uh, you know, calling in a date of having, you know, DiGiorno's pizza and watching Netflix and you know you keep watching the same movie because you keep falling asleep before the end and you want to see what that looks like. Passion. Passion. You kind of get the picture, right? You see, even incredibly passionate people can lose their edge when the excuses start. The same is true about our faith. We can lose our passion when we begin to start making excuses about our faith and our love of God and our love of neighbor. And that kind of got me around to something. What happens when the excuses are gone? Because somewhere in life, you're going to have and run out of excuses, and there are going to be none left, which brings us to our main point. Somewhere you've got to take extreme ownership. And our main point is extreme ownership is a game changer. There's something known as reality therapy in counseling. It basically means that your actions get your consequences. It's not just negative though, it's positive stuff as well. Now, if you want to talk about passionate, I want you to think about what happens to Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas find themselves in a bad situation. They find themselves in one of them their predicaments, if you know what I mean. They've been beaten. Incredible things have happened to them in just a, a matter of hours. And what do we find them doing? We find them being so passionate. They're singing hymns to Jesus. Because what they realize is, is if they're going to spread the Word of God, there are going to be some uncomfortable times, but they can no longer rely on somebody else doing it, but they've got to take extreme ownership of letting the world know about Jesus. They had so much passion. That's what they did. Even if it meant the things that happened in their life. Of someone that could easily have come up with some excuses, I sat there and I thought about, you know, what would it be like for Paul and Silas to say, you know, this is it. You know, we've had a good run. We've had a good ride in this. But now all of a sudden we're getting beat. We're being pulled out into public without our clothes on. We're literally getting beaten black and blue. God, if you'll just get us out of this, we'll we'll just call it even. We'll just call it even. Just get us out. But instead, they take extreme ownership. And they do something about it. They do something about it. I want you to think about this. They were so passionate that the jailer wanted to know more. But not only were they so passionate in the midst of the crisis, they were still passionate afterwards. And they were so passionate that the jailer says, I want what you have. But not only that, the family says, I want what you have. When's the last time you were so passionate about your faith that people that were around you, hearing you talk about Jesus and friendship, that they asked you, Where do you tell me more about this? 
Why, how, how are you so passionate about what you're doing in your own faith? When's the last time you took extreme ownership? So let me ask you this question. When will you take extreme ownership for all that's taking place around you? When will you take extreme ownership for your life, your relationships, your marriage, your children, your parenting, your schedule? See, so many people want to point their finger at their schedule. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I can't do this. I can't join a life group. I can't be at served. And I'm thinking, no, busy is a choice. Busy is a choice. Maybe it just means you're a poor time manager. Because everybody has the same amount of time in each and every day. When are you going to take ownership of that? Or how about your faith? When are you going to quit depending on everybody else to help you grow spiritually and say, you know what? It's on me. I've run out of excuses. Or what about your children's spiritual growth? Now you can show up every so often and that's, I want you to be engaged. Don't hear me wrong. But somewhere you've been given the gift of God in the form of a child. What are you doing? to help them grow spiritually? When are you going to take ownership of that or your church or the spread of the gospel? See, Paul and Silas took extreme ownership. He was passionate. One of the things that that I'm very passionate about is men eating meat. And so, can I get an amen on men eating meat? Yes. And so sometimes I, when we go and men are eating meat and we get to sit around and we get to learn uh, you know, th- new things like what, what Harry does for a living and, and I like to know that uh, he's on the job. Uh, I won't go into that. You had to be there at men eating meat to understand that. But sometimes the ladies say, well, when are you going to do something for us? And I'm say, let me tell you how that works. I'm passionate about men eating meat. I took extreme ownership. I make sure that we have a place at 306. I send out stuff for Taryn to send out so that we might have men eating meat. I take extreme ownership. So ladies, if you're upset about not having a women's thing, you send the information and head it up, take extreme ownership, and get her done. That's what I'm talking about. So when are we going to take extreme ownership? When are we going to drop the excuses? Too many people now say, well, you know what? I've had a hard life. Well, I'm sorry. That sounds like a personal issue. Get over it. Let us help you. If your life's been tough and you haven't gotten to where you need to be, come let me know and let me help you. Take extreme ownership of it. If your kids are acting like wild hellions, take ownership of it. Take ownership. If your faith isn't growing, take ownership. I want to encourage you today, if you hear nothing else, remember, That taking extreme ownership is a game changer. Eventually, you're going to run out of excuses. And some of you still have a few left. You need to go ahead and drop those. And take ownership of your life in all aspects. So what now? If you're a guest, first-time guest this morning, or you're watching online, I try to give you some next steps of what can you do next? What can you do next? And here's, here's an interesting one, too, that I want to add. Because... So many times as a pastor, you know, on a good Sunday, we'll have 650 or so amongst all our campuses and, and whatever. And I love it when people come and ask me, well, you know how so-and-so is doing? I said, no, why don't you tell me? Why hadn't you checked on them? Did you know so-and-so was in the hospital and they want to visit? And I thought, wow, how do they enjoy your visit? Ownership, right? Ownership. So here we go. Next steps. Take ownership of this. Make a list of three things that you were once passionate about, and now you're not. Maybe it's time in your life to revisit whatever it was maybe you were passionate about earlier in life and tackle it. Number two, list the reasons, i.e. excuses, that cause you to lose your passion. Because that's the enemy. That is the enemy of passion or excuses. Number three, list three things that you need to take extreme ownership for in your life. To say, you know what? It's about time that I grew up, and it doesn't matter what age you are, and I took care of this business. Say, the buck stops here, and I'm about to do something about it. Or number four, list three spiritual things you need to take extreme ownership for today in your own life. What do you need to do?
Now this morning I started off with a, with a Navy SEAL story, and I'm going to end with that. And the story that you're about to hear is by a guy named Jocko Willink. And he is a commander on the battlefield. And I think he was the highest commander in this particular fight. And there's going to be an incredible battle to take place. And the problem is, though, is it's friendly fire. There's a battle going on, and they don't realize that they're fighting against one another. The result, there was an Iraqi friendly killed, and one of his seals was injured. Now, while he didn't do it himself, it would have been easy to finger point because he could lose his job. The question is, did he or didn't he take extreme ownership? Let's see. And I will tell you something, it hurt. It hurt my ego, it hurt my pride to take the blame. But I also knew, I knew that to maintain my integrity as a leader and as a man, I had to take responsibility. And in order to do that, I had to control my ego so that my ego did not control me. And you know what? I didn't get fired. In fact, my commanding officer, who had expected excuses and finger pointing, when I took responsibility, when I took ownership, he now trusted me even more. And my men, they didn't lose respect for me. Instead, they realized that I would never shirk responsibility and I would never pass that heavy burden of command down the chain and onto them. And you know what? They had the same attitude. Unlike a team where no one takes ownership of the problems and therefore the problems never get solved with us. Everyone took ownership of their mistakes. Everyone took ownership of the problems. And when a team takes ownership of its problems, the problems get solved. And that is true on the battlefield it is true in business, and it is true in life. So I say, take ownership. Take extreme ownership. Don't make excuses. Don't blame any other person or any other thing. Get control of your ego. Don't hide your delicate pride from the truth. Take ownership of everything in your world, the good and the bad. Take ownership of your mistakes. Take ownership of your shortfalls. Take ownership of your problems. And then take ownership of the solutions that will get those problems solved. Take ownership of your mission. Take ownership of your job, of your team, of your future, and take ownership of your life. And lead. Lead. Lead yourself and your team and the people in your life, lead them all to victory. When will you take ownership? When will you become passionate about the idea that the growth of friendship and the movement of Christianity in this community isn't on Tony and friendship staff? It belongs with all of us. And if you don't start becoming passionate, I'm sending Jocko to your house.
And that's a scary idea. I can't think of a better show of extreme ownership than when God decided to come to this earth and say, I'm going to take care of business. I'm going to provide a way that all their sins are going to be washed away if they will only accept me. The very message that Paul and Silas with so much passion was spreading, we get to remember today. Thanks for watching. We would love for you to connect with us online. On our website, you will find up-to-date information about everything happening around here. Look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are so glad you're here, and we hope you enjoy your friendship experience.